Howdy, guys, gals, non pioneer pals. My name is Crinitix. And I'm Stoic, and this is the Community Chat Show. Your one stop shop for all the latest in the CCS community. With us today, we're so excited, is Flex Player for CCS3, Kalthos Can't Spell, Michaelin. We're very excited to have him here, but before we get too far into talking with Michaelin about his incredible Heroes of the Storm career, we want to make a very quick announcement. And that announcement is, how do I do this? I'm sorry, man. Turn off studio mode. Then the announcement is here. Um, on February 20th, during the CCS development days, CCS will be starting a new segment called the Masterclass, where we will be having featured guests from around the community. And the two first featured guests we'll have is Goon, owner of Wild Heart Esports, as well as Unaverted. DPS player for Wild Heart Esports. They'll be joining the uh, development days to teach sessions. Goon will teach a session on creating a team culture, while Unaverted will talk about team comms. So we're really excited to have this happening. Um, I mean, CCS is a great place to be. You know that we're all about development, and these develop this next development day is going to be excellent. So check out for that coming up soon. Uh, more details will be announced on the server and elsewhere. But extremely hype. We're excited for that. All right, but none of this, who cares about Goon? Who cares about Unaverted? We're here to talk about Michaelin. Um, Michaelin, thank you so much for being here. You know, I've become such a big fan of yours in the last little while. Um, but before uh, we ask any major questions, Michaelin, tell us about yourself. Hey, guys. This is Michaelin. You can call me Michael, Mikey, Mike Chan, whatever floats you vote. Um... You know, as Stoic said, I'm kind of the flex DPS player for Kael'thas Can't Spell, a newcomer to the whole CCS community. I've been playing HOTS for a long time, since Season 1 of NGS. And I've had a blast at all different levels of play, both casually, super competitively, and I've met a lot of awesome people along the way, as well as two of my teammates here today uh, for the charity draft event that CCS held that we... Ended up winning, so super happy to be with them, super proud of that, and excited for the show. Excellent. CCS, uh, we're so glad to have you, but you know, you're know you a veteran. Season one of NGS. I'd love for us to start our conversation there. Uh, Michael, how did you find NGS to be a part of that inaugural season? Yeah, so I started playing this game. Uh, because my friend showed it to me. Uh, Mackenzie, a good friend of mine for a really, really long time, about like half my life, showed me this game. I got super into it. And then when I was around like silver or gold Hero League, you know, just small time pleb trying to, trying to make my way in Hero League at the time, uh, I came across NGS and the idea of joining a competitive team and, you know, kind of enjoying the game it was meant to be played with five stack comms, teammates I could get really close to and coordinate with as we strive to become better players was super, super exciting to me. So I joined season one of NGS, ended up in Division C, the bottom div at the time, and lost every single match. <laughs> so... Yeah, I don't know if we won a single game. We might have won, like, two games the entire season, but definitely lost every match. So that's how good I was. Uh, but, you know, nonetheless, I kept striving, kept looking hard. Next season, placed middle of C, you know, on improvement there, and... Yeah, I was still having fun. Like, ev like I think this is such a great game because even if you suck, even if you're really bad and losing, you can still have a blast if you just have awesome teammates and you're just having fun in the game. So Very true. that's basically where my start was in this game. So it, it kind of sounds like you kind of took to the competitive scene like right away. Is this something that, like, like have you been playing other games competitively for like a long time now or is this kind of the first game you delved into in a competitive at a competitive level yeah this is the absolute first game i really delved into and really stuck with um 
I'm the kind of person who will try a game for a bit, you know, maybe get hooked for like a couple of weeks and then just get bored and find something else. But, you know, something about Heroes of the Storm just clicked for me and I've been hooked ever since. So this was my first kind of experience in the competitive scene. I think partially why I was so bad initially is because I was a newcomer to, to playing, you know, esports or competitive games, period. So after that, after that beating it with Team Conflict in Division C, um, what made you stay? Like, there's obviously something that drove you after losing every game. I mean, to get to gold, you have to win some games. So you'd won games before. What was it that made you come? What made you, after getting the beating? What made you come back? Uh, telling myself that it can only get better. Like, you know, mathematically you actually can't do worse than losing every <laughs> single match in a season. So, in a really positive light, it could only get better from there. And that's a really exciting prospect to me, to just go into Season 2 and be like, basically, no matter what I do, this is going to be an improvement for me. I'm going to learn a lot, and I'm going to become a get better player. And losing wasn't that bad. I had great teammates. I had a ton of fun with this game and uh, playing as a competitive team. So it really wasn't that bad despite the outcome. Hmm. What, uh, how did you, like, how did these teammates, like, did you just, did it start out great? Like, did you just happen to find the perfect four other people who were fun and chill and good to play with? So it's a funny story because I, essentially the way the team formed is I joined kind of like one of those typical team recruitment posts, went to a tryout. And the actual, like, presenter, poster of that uh, of that ad and the team captain of the team turned out to be really unlikable. Like, really toxic. Okay. Like, basically quit on the team after the first session because people were, like being too bad um so that was kind of awkward but like all the people who came for that trial were like well we still want to have a team so let's just make a team ourselves and so that's kind of how that started uh kind of just a bunch of ragtag people all looking for a tryout ended up making their own team so i had never known these people before we were completely fresh to the scene together complete strangers and you know something about it just clicked maybe not performance wise but you know chemistry wise and and fun factor was definitely there and so you said that you lost all the games in the first season and in the second season you got about halfway through was the roster that you got like halfway through the season with the same as the first season or did you have some roster changes between seasons hmm If it, I mean, this is a, quite a while yeah. ago. So. It is a long time ago. I I don't want to be wrong, but I'm pretty sure we had one roster, one person swap. But I don't think that was a big defining factor. I think we all were excited to improve, learned a lot from getting our butts beat, and really, you know, put our best foot forward and really looked to improve that second season. Okay, so you play in that first season, lose a lot of games. You do much better in that second season. Um, we uh, have a clip, I think, from I think what it, I think what was. Oh, you know what? Never mind. This is actually our clips. We don't have these pod clips until until a little bit later. So let's jump into the next phase. So you you play two seasons with Team Conflict. After that, you you've started college. It's tw it's the mm -hmm. early twenty eighteen. And you join a, you join Heroes of the Dorm. And more than join, you decide that you're going to start the team for the Colorado School of Mines. Talk us through that experience. Well, yeah. just the starting of the team. Not the whole Colorado School of Mines blasting Burroughs team. Just just the beginning of like the inception of, of the Heroes of the Dorm team. Absolutely. So my last team, Team Conflict, as much fun as we had, 
and as proud as I was to be on that team and how much we improved and to know all those guys that some of them I still talk to now, um, fortunately it didn't work out. Some people just got too busy, um, and I think the roster was just too much of a skeleton crew to really, like, find the new additions we needed. We basically needed to, like, fill three more main roster spots. And at that point, I think most people would just rather make a new team. So, you know, I went out looking for a new team until I came across this this Heroes of the Dorm concept that I hadn't heard of before, and I was like, that's really cool, especially since I just just started schooling at Colorado School of Mines. Um, you know, let's let's look into that. Turns out we don't have a team yet. So <laughs> I just make one. Um and this is another team of just people I didn't know at all. Like I just basically tried to find the only other four people at my school <laughs> who actually play this game. <laughs> Like I, I posted in the uh, the school's like esports Discord, seeing if anyone played this game, and I got like a couple of responses. Uh, I went to the Heroes of the Dorm Reddit page to see anyone from Colorado School of Mines on this Reddit page and want to join my team. Got one there, and then made a team on the actual Heroes of the Dorm website to get my last player, who was actually Zhao. And that's how we got our five-man squad, basically last minute, right before uh, the first Heroes of the Dorm that we participated in. Wow. So what did that kind of look like then? Like, your group of people just kind of coming together, no one really knowing each other. Um, as the captain of that team, like, what did your... Pra like, did you practice much at all, or did you guys just kind of come show up to game time? Like, what did that Oh, it was like? a mess at first. I didn't know what I was doing <laughs> at all. Um... <laughs> Gosh, I don't... We had, like, Zhao on tank at the start, and it was awful. He is such a bad tank player. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah. It was wild at the start. We definitely tried to get some practices in. I think we got one practice in before the event itself. So, and and then we we had scrims, like, you know, in the meantime as well. Usually it'd be like one or two matches a week, and then we'd have like an additional one or two scrims each week as well. And we were really trying to get better. It was kind of a miracle, but like for some reason, the four random people I found all had pretty similar goals and mindsets of we want to get better at this game, we want to play to win, and we're willing to put in some time to do that. So, yeah. We didn't do super well our first go around. I think we made like top 64 out of like 100 or 200 teams. I don't know the exact numbers, but yeah, we, we did a pretty, had a pretty okay result. And then from then on, we decided we want to keep playing, keep improving. So that's how we got involved in NGS as Blasting Burgers. Coming together is, is a five stack and, and just randomly stumbling on five people who are at the same school, who have unified goals playing competitive is, is, is huge and, and incredible. Um, what, other than having those same goals and being on that same page there, what, what were some other drivers for growth during, I mean, either your first seasons of NGS or more specifically during this first season of Heroes of the Dorm, what did you saw that helped your team, you know, start to take off? I think a big factor is the other, I guess at this time I was playing offlane, but I guess one of our like ranged DPS players named Time is an absolutely phenomenal player. He played for Trademark Gaming in HTC Open. He was, you know, consistently, consistently, you know, top GM ranged player. And so he was really the main person who came into our team and just knew his stuff and knew how to play the game and kill nerds over the internet. So we learned a lot from him. I personally took a huge inspiration from him. I wanted to play like him. I wanted to learn as much as I could from him and really help this team grow together. So that was a big thing for me. And I think the rest of my team took on to that as well as we have a great coach 
it's you know kind of rare that you just magically are like oh this you know top gm player is randomly on my dorm team you know let's take advantage of of this great fortune so you know his coaching and his help really really propelled us from going from you know a middle of the road dorm team to eventually top four and if and if i remember correctly in, in that first season you guys played in dorm, the Blasting Burrows, Time actually was still a Time was still a senior in high school. Yep. Yeah. So he was so he was your coach before he even played. He knew he was going to CSM, and so he acted mm-hmm. as your coach. What was that experience like? Having this coach be someone who was, in, you know, in a different stage of life. Did yeah, it make a difference? Interesting. It's interesting because, you know, you're getting coached by someone who's a year younger than you. For some people on my team, it was like several years younger than you, but I think everyone did a great job of kind of just respecting that this, you know, senior in high school knows his stuff, and he knows it far better than we do, and we can still listen to him, even though he he's pretty young, you know, still, like, preparing for his senior prom at the time. But, you know, time's an awesome dude. I love him with all my heart. Um, He's a fantastic friend. And he was really, really great at just cultivating growth from all of us and not acting super, like, superior or posh at all towards us in terms of his skill. You know, he was just there to help us, there to win. Like, I mean, he wasn't even in it for anything before he was even in college. Like, he had, he had absolutely no stake in our performance. But he still offered to coach us even before he was out of school and not our team. And I really, really appreciate that. Yeah, definitely. You sound like a great guy. Um, we have a question from Goon in the chat. Uh, were there any expectations the team set for themselves? Expectations? Like like goals? Yes, I, I assume that that's what, uh, what Goon's referencing. Like... As far as your overall development and progress as a team, like, do you have any sort of? I mean, this first go of Heroes of the Dorm was basically just have fun, see how well we do, and treat that as a benchmark. And going into NGS after that, we got placed in Division A. Our goal was to to win that um and overall big goals for the team i think were just to keep improving um keep swimming better and better teams something that helped us a lot was having like rivalries with certain teams that were like around our skill level maybe better and see if we could catch them in terms of improvement like essentially there's Anytime you're playing this game, there's going to be a team that's better than you. And, you know, you can make it a goal to be better than them right now. Or you can make it a goal to be better than them in the future, if that makes sense. So sometimes it's not always about chasing this static goal and being like, I want to be better than this. But rather, you have to keep your eyes on a team's trajectory and their velocity and be like, I want to improve at a faster rate than them, so I'll catch them sometime in the future. And that's a really interesting mindset to have that helped us a lot because it made it so that we weren't just better than we were yesterday. We were this amount better than we were yesterday. Our improvement was going at this set rate that was faster than you know another team that we considered rivals, if that makes sense at all. Yeah, my question is, is how do you, I mean, did you, did you only, how, how could you track that? Would you just keep track of like during scrims or during seasoned matches? Like, oh, we beat this rival or this other team. Like, how would you keep track of like, okay, we've actually improved by X amount or to the nth degree? Yeah, it'd be scrim results, uh, match results. Obviously, scrim results aren't always super reliable because teams aren't always playing to win, they're playing to improve, and sometimes that doesn't reflect in the actual score. So, map scores, like actual match map scores would be a big one, but 
scrims definitely do play a factor because we did scrim a lot of teams regularly to kind of gauge how we were compared to them. Okay. Go ahead, Kern, sorry. So, so tell us a little bit about uh, these rivalries you mentioned before. Like, what kind of... Is, is that something that you're, you're willing to talk about? Like, what kind of... Who, who were you guys really rivaled with? Like, what was that like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for NGS, the big team that we were kind of rivals with was Team Freelo. This was a team with um, Hollis, an old, really, really good tank player in the Heroes of the Storm community, um, and some other players on that team I can't really remember. But yeah, they were our big rivals. Like, just before the season started, I think we scrimmed them and had like a 2-2 map score, and then scrimmed them several, several times over the season, always going very, very close. In the actual NGS regular season itself, we went 1-1. Because at the time, the format was just you play two games. Um, and there's not really like a tiebreaker game, if that makes sense. And, yeah. Yeah. And then we went to playoffs, and I believe they beat us 2-1. So we ended up getting second in the finals that season. And then... Uh, the next season, they actually moved up to the division above that, Heroic, and we still scrimmed them pretty regularly, um, went pretty even with them again, and we ended up winning that season in, in Division A, um, our second go-around. So I, will, I would definitely say that having rivalries, um, especially friendly rivalries, where you're willing to, like, you know, help each other out and, you know, give each other feedback and not not always be like butting heads is super, super helpful. And I think kind of leans back into what we have in the CCS community, where it's really, really awesome for us to be like, you know, hey, CCS too, you know, Brainer and those guys, we got your number. Um, we're we're going to beat you next match, you know. Maybe you'll beat us the match after that, but we have this rivalry going. But at the same time, like after the game, you know, I'll message Wolf or Brainer, and we'll we'll talk about what happened, what both teams can do to improve, maybe share some tips. So we're kind of cultivating that growth together, and I think it's really, really healthy for teams to try and find rivalries like that to cultivate improvement. You know, yeah, for sure. Some some of this improvement um, in my in my research, I was able to see from these. Uh, these clips like in there were some i found some clips for when you played on team conflict some great plays seemed like a lot of gray main um and making plays there i want to share uh two quick clips with the stream of incredible plays both from the damage slot uh as well as um in the offlane one of these clips is going to be from an ngs match uh, one of these would be from tespa let's see if i can figure out how to do this um, boom, boom. All right, stream. Here we go. This is a this is a clip from NGS season two or three. I think it was before uh, the Blasting Burrows made their rise to Division A when they were uh, taking names down in Division C. And Michelin still in the chase. He just wants those kills. He's fragging right now. Yeah. They might be able to get this. Johanna took a little too long. Oh my goodness, the double! Oh the double with the W from Michelin. That was a great play. So, uh, Michael in there taking some names with Hanzo, knowing those scatter arrows. Something that his team has told me in, in other side conversations that the man had every single Hanzo angle memorized. And here's another one showing prowess on not only just the ranged players, but also some skills in the offlane. That one, I just absolutely love that clip there. Just watching Michaelin literally body this blaze, preventing to make sure that that uh, that webweaver can't get into lane. 
Um, some of these, like, Michael, and these are incredible, like, micro tactics, both of these, both being able to hit the Hanzo Ws to know that angle, to be able to get a double kill off a single ability, as well as um, being able to body block so efficiently there on the Urel. What was, uh, like, how did you get, like, what's your secret behind being able to pull off these cr these crazy micro plays? Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, a lot of it is just watching other people play and learn from that. I mentioned, like, Time is a really fantastic ranged player, and he is by far the, the main Hanzo player for our team. So I learned a lot of my Hanzo play from him. Um, I would consider him, like, one of the, the best Hanzo players in, like, HGC Open at the time. His Anzu was absolutely incredible. Um, and yeah, he gave me a lot of really, really good tips on the Hanzo and how to play it pretty well. In that clip in particular, I kind of just shot a W at the tower and hoped it hit. It wasn't really anything special about that. As much as I'd, I'd like to, to lie and say it was a 600 IQ play, you know, like I ran the calculation, uh, you know, did the Pythagorean theorem on that triangle <laughs> to, to hit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was just kind of like there's three low HP people, you know, retreating behind that tower. If I can shoot a, a W past that area, I'm sure something will bounce and things will die. And that ended up being true. Uh, in that second play there, I think a lot of that is just me watching like really good offlane players. I watched a lot of Wubby doing his prime in HGC. And I think that's one of those plays that's important in offlane where sometimes, you know, even more important than paying attention to what you're trying to achieve is pay attention to what your opponent is trying to achieve. There's a lot of situations in offlane matchups where you know, you can just double soak, catch all the soak, not really interact with your laner at all, and it's kind of whatever. Or you could play to deny them XP. So you're kind of getting a little bit less of what you want because you're losing some soak, but you're denying what they want, which is also soak. And, you know, depending on the situation, that could be equally or even more viable of a tactic. And in this case right now, Basically, what I want to be doing is just clearing the wave and getting my web weaver up to the towers. But what Blaze wants to do is clear my web weaver, and I think preventing him what he wants to do is a little bit more valuable in that situation. So that's just all that is. So what you're telling us is that you're not only incredibly skilled, but you're also quite humble, um, which is a good t which is a good trait, uh, good talent to have. You, you name dropped Wubby there, and for those in chat who don't know, this is not Grubby from CCL and Heroes Hearth. This is um, this is Wubby, fantastic HGC player. What, what was your relation? You said you'd never watched, you'd never heard of Heroes of the Dorm before going to CSM. What was your relationship with HGC though? Before uh, did you, did you watch HGC before starting NGS? Did getting an NGS inspire you to start watching the competitive scene? Or what's your what's your relationship like with the pro scene at this point? I never watched HGC until I really wanted to improve and learn from the top players. For me personally, I'm a competitor first and a viewer second. So, you know, anytime I could be watching these really big HGC games, I'd probably rather just be playing my own competitive games but when i wasn't playing competitive games you know people would turn me on to this hgc and be like look at these awesome plays and that really helped me get super excited to improve and learn more and i got a lot a lot of value by just downloading replays from hgc games and just watching the camera of a specific player and learning what they do. I think that's a really, really underutilized thing that, that players who want to improve can do. It's a thing that's still available now. You can pull all of the CCL replays from the Heroes for Discord. So, 
you know, if you're like, oh, I want to become a really good Zeratul, you know, let's find out what kind of players are playing Zeratul. Um, I do recommend looking at Kiru from Simplicity. Just pull up a match that Simplicity played with Kiru's on Zeratul, download that replay from the Heroes Hearth Discord, and then literally watch that player play and think to yourself, what are they trying to do? How can I learn from this? How can I put this into my own gameplay? And that's a really, really smart and valuable way to improve as a player. Yeah, it's a fantastic idea. Um, I, I just want to bring back to something you said a moment ago. So you said that you were a competitor first and a viewer second, right? Uh, was HGC ever something that was in your uh, scope? Like, was that something that you were wanting to kind of be a part of someday? Like, was that sort of like the end game behind a lot of your improvement? Hmm. Maybe. I think at certain times, that would be a super, super lofty goal for me. Um, I don't think I'm going to pretend I was even close to HGC, even when I was not my prime playing this game, to be honest. Um, for me, the big, big goal was to maybe win Dorm. And after that, if I had achieved that, maybe my next lofty big, big goal would have been HGC. But it wasn't quite on my radar until I had gone, you know, in my opinion, smaller achievements. Okay. So a, a, a quick follow-up question. Sorry, sorry, Stoic. Just a quick... Uh, so when HGC then, you know, the, the whole Brack letter, like... It's it's getting the axe. Did that kind of, how did that kind of affect you and your team's uh, outlook on competitive hots? Were you kind of like, yeah, we can still play grassroots, or was it kind of like, eh, it's over. Let's just kind of do other things. It was really devastating for my team, to be honest. Um, one thing that goes a little bit overlooked is when the ash, the axe came down on HCC. The axe also came down on Heroes of the Dorm. So my team and I kind of lost our truly collegiate um, outlet into Heroes of the Storm. Luckily, TESPA continued kind of a, a smaller, you know, TESPA collegiate Heroes of the Storm uh, sort of league format for, I think, two more seasons two or three more seasons um, before eventually even that got closed down because I think they wanted to rather pursue other games. So, yeah. I would say, you know, the acts of entirely Heroes of the Storm sponsored esports was like the big the big wound to my team and then Tesla Collegiate closing down entirely was like the the nail in the coffin for my college team, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, sorry to all those who had to be reminded of the awfulness of that letter that we got a couple of years ago now. Um, sad day for, for so many. But uh, I, I think there's something to be said, though. Like, Michael, in here, you, you've mentioned quite a few times here, my team, my team, my team. Uh, but you haven't ever said we. Like, you, you've stuck it out here. So... I mean, Blizzard cancels HGC, um, but you know, but but you still got, you guys still stuck around. And I mean, later some of the, some it sounds like your teammates have have moved on, but you haven't. Like right after Blizzard cancels HGC, what was like? It, it's the big hit. It's a it's a bummer. Um, but but you know, we'd spoken previously, and you said we, you really try harder that next TESPA, so the spring 2019 TESPA series. What was uh, what was your personal take going into that? that first TCS. Yeah, so this was essentially supposed to be the Heroes of the Dorm, where our team has had a year to improve since the last one. We've had time on our roster, obviously a huge addition, and, you know, we're looking to, to maybe win this. We're looking to do very, very well. Um, you know, the, the announcement comes, the dark day, so to speak, and, you know, we lose a bit of hope 
but because uh, TCS is so you know close on the horizon, we decide to still try hard it because it would feel super super bad to have trained like this entire year for completely nothing. You know, at least we still get to like test our metal in this smaller format. So we play in that. We try really hard. We do our absolute best, and we get, I believe, top four. I don't know if we would have gone that high in actual Heroes of the Dorm, because I do think there was uh, a pretty big drop mm -hmm. in the number of teams actually competing. I'm sure a lot of teams stopped pl trying as hard, stopped practicing as soon as the announcement come, but I'm, I'm still exceptionally proud of the top four placement. Yeah, I want to go. Let's go through and highlight a couple, before we talk any more about um, about that. I want to go through and highlight some of these incredible plays uh, from that season here, uh, that spring twenty nineteen Tespa Collegiate Series. Let me pull up. Let's just look, we'll just look at three here, um, and this is like when really I feel like Michael and as a player starts to. Uh, you thought he was fragging before. Just wait. All right, here's one against University of Arkansas. And ready to throw down. Clustered positioning hasn't necessarily been a problem for Arkansas this game in terms of what they have to watch out for, but Slaughterhouse is definitely... Here's Michael in 1v5-ing. McAllen, they decide to jump in here. That is some considerable damage, and here comes the Slaughterhouse. Hello? Are you kidding me? Anubarak detonated. Silvani. We'll, pa we'll pause right there, right before Michael in unfortunately mm -hmm. falls. But uh, there's, there's more where that came from, don't you worry. Um... I kind of feel like I entered there. <laughs> very, very quiet. Let's see who they're going to be able to jump on. Justice gets done absolutely wrong. Morales in the cocoon, unable to do anything. Slaughterhouse doesn't net too much. That's going to be... Uh, Here we go, Michael in 2v5-ing. Anubarak doing big things right now. Butcher gets blown up. Void Prison, a hair late. But it's there. Well, it's up to McKaylin, but there's another good drag on to Jack's tax man. McKaylin, of course, living with that level 20 value in the 16th round. And Dahaka's just no. trying to make sure this doesn't fall apart. The damage numbers for no. Zeratul are actually insane. Somehow able to survive throughout all of this. Have their hat, no slouch in there as well as he uses that W value, that speaker in the dark. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Two values, three set, one more time? Oh my god! No! The actual 2v team! What is going on right now? The moment. Just a little quick clip, very, little there. Very quiet. Of Michael and Time just, you know, doing their thing. And then, oh man, there's so, I have so many clips here. I wish I could show them all. Um, let's show uh, one of these bad boys here. Last one for us. For at least th for this moment. Into 16 and Jay, how they just they back off. We get this rag. Well, lob wave, wall. Uh, false that. Oh, that's a rough spot to be in. And Ragnaros is trying to just get their get themselves out of here. Sal's got some great healing, but will it be enough? I cannot believe this. There's no way Ragnaros lives. <laughs> you serious this right now? Are we? Is this is this real life? The slow goes on a protection. They actually. Right there, sounds is going to be out as well. <laughs> and the spicy meatball for the finish. Michaelin finding value no matter how many times he's outnumbered. <laughs> okay, so these plays are actually from the next TCS season. <gasps> oh no. Um, this, is, this is after the team has mostly stopped practicing and we decided to do one last season just for the the heck of it and all of our comps that season were randomly generated so we played completely random heroes every game and tried like, to make it work like actually so, randomly generated yes oh my goodness we have some comp sci nerds on our team. So someone like actually made a program to randomly assign us a hero pick every single round in draft. And 
we, you know, we played some wild heart things, essentially. So that's why those comps, those games, maybe aren't considered conventionally the best. But the the you're telling me that the Ragnaros Smash Wombo was was this is randomly generated? This is beautiful. Let's let's just pull it up. I'll pull it up on stream so everyone can see. But stuff like this, you, the, the computer must have known right that you guys could frag like crazy. Let's before Baja gets too far ahead of us here. Let's watch just one more clip here. Fly up here right now. They might have scouted a couple members coming up here, but they're a little bit split. They need to make sure they, they get back onto the friendly side of this. It is going to be Purifier being on to this Maev right now. They're going to try and get the swap to maybe slow them down, chases them out. That will also be the Dragon Strike from the Arrow, or Dragon Strike from the Hanzo right there. Mostly just zones them back. No one on the point just yet. They have a 17% for this cage. Ragnaros with the Sulfur Smash. For me, that's like you planned it. <laughs> but either way well done it's it's imp it's impressive play some of these clips i've watched I, it, it's hard to know when they're from and I, I, that's incredible incredible play especially if it's all randomly generated yeah thank you i appreciate that i it's it's an interesting kind of experiment or perhaps like training drill of just getting these random heroes and trying to figure out before the game how do we actually make this work and it kind of makes you look at the game in another way because you know we have to find things like that like the only way we can possibly win a team fight is if we get like a maya pull into a ragnaro smash to one shot someone you know otherwise we don't have a tank and we can't win a super long sustained team fight yeah, we had a, a question in chat from the main ski. Uh, were, was it like a true random, or were you guys making sure you guys had a tank and a healer? But I guess you just you said you didn't have a tank, right? Like, did you try to make sure you had a healer at least, or was it just completely 100% random? Completely random? We had many games with no supports, and they were rough. We had some game. We had one game with four supports that was also pretty rough. Sometimes the algorithm was merciless to say the least. Wow. I mean, the, the Abathur Morales uh, Zero Tool game on Alterac Pass, I've seen many clips from there, including the uh, stimmed Abathur taking that middle bruiser camp. I, I should have had that one lined up to play, but there's quite a few clips from that uh, fall Tespa season from you guys. Um, that was a fun season, I can't lie. Yeah, I, I can't I can't imagine um, running in there and being able to play at such a high level while who knows uh, what you're going to end up picking up there. Fujin Fujin asks in chat what what happened uh, with your program when your opponents would ban something like if if the algorithm says oh Michael and you get Zeratul this game but they know to ban it what uh what 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 did you do then? Yeah, that was something we we could specifically kind of deal with like we just run it again. Mm -hmm. If a hero was was banned, and yeah, just just dodge. You just dodged the whole game. Yeah, just, exactly. We we just everybody alt F four. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, so by this point, you between the, straddling these two Tespa seasons, you've you know you've got this win in Division A of, of NGS. You have the sadness of losing. Um, from HGC, but still the excitement of, you know, the TESPA top four, and then you're back in TESPA. Um, but shortly after that, like, that, that was the end. Like, TESPA, fall 2019 was the end of the Blasting Burrows. Was it like a formal, everyone on the team kind of like wrote up their 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 tweet of, you know, their, their twit longer and then just posted it and they stopped showing up to practice? Or as sad as this moment was, what was the dissolution like for the Blasting Burrows? Uh, we just had to talk about it after the season. You know, we, we just got all into a voice call together. It was very, very sad. But, you know, basically, everybody said they were... Everyone except for me, basically, just said they were pretty much done with the game. Um, They, you know, weren't having as much fun as they used to now that Tespa was out and the game, you know, was was dying a bit after the collapse of HGC. Um, many of them had moved on to other games like 
I believe Time, Tiddly, He, and Zhao are all playing League now. Um, and then Commander Lemming um, basically graduated from university at that time, and he's now pursuing work in computer science. So basically everyone had kind of moved on, and that really sucked. I considered quitting. I basically did for like maybe a half a year to a year after that, and then decided to, to get back into it because I missed it, because I missed playing and, you know, pulling off awesome things like in these Twitch clips and having a team. So I joined some other like kind of random teams um, in lower divisions because I was washed up and <laughs> not trying as hard. I played for a variety of teams like Winky Face, uh, World Hunger Avoidance Team, Doubled Kegs, Animaniacs, and ended up on Kalthos Can't Spell, and I've been having a blast. Before we get too deep into that, um, I'd love to know from this. Um, you from before you said you know you you associated their fun and. Uh, Heroes of the Dorm, that there was this, because the highest level of play was taken away, that the fun had changed for you and for your team. Um, what is it about competition that is, that's fun and that drives you? Hmm. It's just a really, really awesome feeling and surge of endorphins to have worked really, really hard for something and come out on top. Like, I don't know, like, the chemicals in your brain that occur after winning a really, really, you know, meaningful and challenging Heroes of the Door match are, like, unparalleled. And that was a really, really big thing for me and I think the rest of my team. And eventually why they unfortunately stopped playing is because I think they didn't feel like they could get that feeling anymore. Like as awesome as the communities we have and the Heroes of the Storm uh, community we have, like NGS, Heroes Lounge, now CCL, I think for them personally, they didn't maybe take them as seriously as they did Heroes of the Storm and didn't feel as if maybe the time investment was worth, you know, getting that feeling again in perhaps shorter supply. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. Uh, so we kind of kind of going a little off script here. Uh, so you've played from, you started out in Div C, right? Like the at the time, yeah. the lowest division, losing every single game. All the way up to the point of scrimming against heroic div teams, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you've seen the whole spectrum. In your opinion, what div is the most fun or most enjoyable? <laughs> the best division? Ooh. Gosh, that's a hard one. I mean, for me personally, it's just whatever division I belong in because it's really, really awesome to like you know, actually feel challenged and be like, yes, you know, I worked hard and got to this next level. Um, and an overall thing, man, like, Div C people know how to party. They know how to bring yeah. up the memes and the dreams. Like, something that kind of sucks when you get into, like, this, the higher levels is people aren't memeing enough. Like, <laughs> I want people to draft stupid things, and it just doesn't happen enough in Heroic. Like, people are just, like, picking meta things and being like, ooh, I want to win. And in Div C, you got people, like, pulling out these crazy things, just having fun. And that's always really, really refreshing, in my opinion. All right, you heard it here first, folks. Div C, best div. Um, what, um, 
bringing like that experience of like wanting the wanting to keep it fun but also keep it try hard um what was your experience with you know world hunger avoidance time or world hunger avoidance team your you're registered for that team three different times, you know, deviled kegs, animating us. Obviously, there's some fun in the naming of these teams. How much fun did you bring into the drafting? I guess I guess a better question is, like, what role did you play on these teams? Were you drafting? Were you shot calling? Were you captaining these teams? Um, and and from there, like, what, what, what did you do to bring fun to each of them? You know, honestly, something I really struggle with is bringing the balance between try hurting and fun i feel a lot of times i'm on either side of the spectrum like you can kind of see that between the two T- tcs seasons i feel most clearly is like first season super super try hard we only pick like super meta heroes um you know scrimming constantly trying our absolute best to just win as many matches as we can and then season two where we literally randomly generated our drafts and just, you know, trolled around a bit. And, you know, part of my experience playing after that is trying to balance competitiveness and tryharding and fun. And, so yeah, I think on the first team I sort of made coming back into that was World Hunger Avoidance Team, uh, acronym WHAT for short was you know trying to have a little bit more of a relaxed time in division c after not playing very much and being extremely rusty and also still being incredibly competitive and wanting to win so that's something i've kind of like tried to to balance better moving forward and i don't think i have the perfect solution for it i think i'm still quite a ways off but yeah, it's difficult. I'm sorry if that doesn't really answer the question at all, but no, I mean I think it's great. It's it's fascinating to think yeah. that like, and it, it prevents it presents a good view of you as a player where you're on these two poles, where you're either full try hard or you're full fun, um, and, and I think it's something that a lot of us do struggle with. Some of us don't have the the ability to be on both poles. Where most of us are just stuck on one side. Um, so finding that middle ground is, I'm sure, a challenge that many people uh, are in a similar state and struggle with. Yeah, especially like I, I've, it's um, a notion that I've seen tossed around a lot in this, especially in the CCS community, is like um, trying to find that balance of you know uh, keeping it fun, like you know, because it is a, a game, uh, but still being able to compete and and you know make notable. Uh, leaps of improvement. So I, I know that you said that you don't really have a perfect answer for it, but like, what do you, what do you think is is your answer for kind of finding that middle ground between like, you know, the the sweaty scrimming against heroic div teams or just basically a ramming. Oh. it's tough. I think. Probably the biggest thing is just making sure your entire team is is on the same page. Um, you know, I think any way of playing this game is perfectly viable. You can, you know, be on super, super far on one end of the spectrum where, you know, if I'm not winning, I'm not having fun. Or you could be like, you know, we only play absolute, you know, trash cops <laughs> and, you know, just mess around every game. And both of those are absolutely viable as long as you're having fun. But I think everyone on your team has to be on board. And if you kind of don't constantly check up with your team and they're like, hey, are we, you know, okay with this? Are we still on board with this? Then that creates friction and issues over time. For sure, yeah important professional skills frankly like it's it's there's there's a lot of stuff in hots and from the team oriented things that like are just you either have to learn good practices or you get to apply these you know good practices to make sure that your team is 
is in a good spot, like through either be, you know, communication, accountability, goal setting. I, I've been, that, that just thinks, reminds me of all of the things that I've been able to like say, oh, like I learned this in a class once, or I read this, about this in a book. Um, so, so after all these teams, all this memory, you find yourself uh, at the end of season 10 looking for a new spot. Um, what's the story about? How'd you find CCS and how did, uh, how'd you convince Crush to take you on? Hmm. I, so I was coming out of a season with Animaniacs where the team ended up disbanding um, at the end of the season for various, you know, like personal reasons, kind of the typical reasons. And then I was just looking for a new team. I made a post in, in the free agent Discord channel on NGS and Crush thought he, he saw some promise in me and thought we could we could make a good team together. So he hit me up, asked me to kind of be the fifth on his team. And, you know, we played, uh, I played a few sessions with the team, loved them all, had a lot of fun, and I guess the guest is just kind of history. Um, I've been having a blast with every person on the team. Crush is kind of the, the super, you know, the big brain of the team. He handles all the drafting, all the kind of leadership boss things. Um, Joyf is our tank. He runs it down sometimes. <laughs> usually kills more people than... Like, he usually kills two people for every time he feeds. Not always, <laughs> but usually usually it's, you know, mathematically in our favor. We have Noctix, the, the mute support. He says absolutely nothing every game, but he stops me from feeding, so I can't complain too much. We got... Uh, Ulysses in the off lane. I don't see him too much. I miss him. But sometimes we gotta go back to our off lane. And then I'm just a Kerrigan one trick, honestly. Like, gosh, every single draft crushes, like, let's pick Kerrigan. And then I run it down. Ha has Crush seen your Zeratul clips? I mean, that, that seems like an untapped resource there. I don't know, man. Like, I don't know if I'm just washed up on Zeratul or what, but we we just aren't finding the success with it, and I think it's it's something we're working on. I think sometimes I'll just drop a VP, and then no one dies, and I'm very sad. Probably a combination of multiple things, but... I have a uh, collection of clips that will do two things for us here. One, I think it will make you quite happy and show that you you definitely know how to kill people and buildings. And two, it'll it'll be a little highlight reel of all these things that Crush could put you on and get uh, a little bit of value. So cue a small clip roll. I'll start with this one. Oh, man. Wow, this tower is actually falling so fast just off of the spam, and now there's a full Zerg wave as well. I feel like time is really trying to pressure Gul'dan from clearing for free, but uh, Gul'dan dots are doing work. Here's a Genji though, really aggressive X strike, ends up just following it up with a swift strike. Gul'dan falls, big taunt on the Garrosh, Chromie follow up around the Cho'Gal, and Cho'Gal falls as well, and now Stukov, I don't think he's getting out of here. He looks like he wants to live somehow, but Loop is going to pull him back in. Boom, there's one. There's a Genji triple kill for you. Let's uh, let's see what else we can find here from the uh, bag of tricks. We don't need any Kerrigan clips. We've got enough of those. We've seen some Hanzo stuff. We've seen Genji. Let's go for Tracer. Making plays with Tracer. Here we go. For about a week's time. So don't worry. Dr. Mantis, if you want to get up in here, shoulder to shoulder with that green fish. <laughs> 
Ooh, big engagement mid lane. Soulfied getting awfully low. Paul Fong coming out <laughs> and a gift. connecting. Definitely a gift for about a week. There's a gift there for your team. Here's just uh, here's a classic. One of the best clips that I've maybe ever seen before. Um, on the. I mean, this is an iconic they're clip, frankly. The entire siege. They're trying to slow them down. Jayhow, this is a keep going down sub five minutes or just about five minutes. The Grimman's going to die for it unless he gets out of here. Ooh, razor swipe roll. This is Artanis being targeted. And this is a mini wave coming in. Punisher now goes down and they get the fort in mid lane, but five are pushing in through mid and I think they want to try and even out that keep pressure, but they don't have a wave here. Oh no, they do. Okay, sorry. I missed the wave and Sylvanas might be able to lock this down in a couple seconds. I have to look really quickly. Four seconds on her They're tree. They're on core. No way. All no, right, no, no. Look, they actually die on core. You actually cannot. They can get some core damage. So I think their plan is to get some core damage. Although Artana says, I've got shields for days. Shields for days. Sur shield surge, by the way. Shield surge, by the way. Colorado School of Mud. Five and a half. No way. No Chief way. No way. Look out. Wait. They have done it. Straight. Run it down. Everything I ever said about a team running it down. Not trying to win there we the go. Not There's uh, a gray man clip for you. Let me get. We got a. Uh, I'll get two more. Two more. Two more. Wait. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. This is the one I want. Down quite effectively from that last push that they oh, had. Oh, I'm a hundred percent with you. Instead, they're opting to try and gank this Ural. Ganking uh -oh. the Ural gets rid of all of their gems, but now 13, they're not even going to get the gank. They just got juked left and right, as Haloran would say, some ankles just got broken. There's there's breaking ankles on Tyrael to keep his team alive. Uh, and we'll get one... Oh no, I don't have any more that's not Zeratul. So let's just get one more... Let's get one Zeratul clip. Just to show that Michael and does definitely know how to uh, get the Zeratul VP combo kills. And two got through. Third one dies. Uh, that was not the clone. Lots of damage does go out as well as the Void Prison. Is this a disengage? Does not look like it as lots of damage comes out with the Dragon Strike onto the left team. Leading to a quad kill at the hands of the Hanzo and the Nano Boosted Zeratul. Boom. That's, uh, there's our little clip clip drive for you. Michael and definitely playing an array of heroes knowing how to end games. Definitely a thing that, I, I, I don't know if Crush knew it, um, but a lot of these other pros knew it. I mean, we got people uh, calling you at one point one of the top offlaners in NGS in North America. Like, I mean, and we've seen you at top offlane play from you, Rel. I mean, I didn't, I don't think I showed the five-man blade stun or the thrall 1v5-ing with walking away with three kills as well. Definitely, uh, Maybe as Dwarf says in chat, the team just needs to figure out how to play with a with Zeratul as good as Michael. In. Wow, that's incredibly kind and perhaps unwarranted, but thank you. <laughs> so, um, CCS3, we're here. You've been picked up. What are the goals? Mm -hmm. Like, you're now on this team. You've had this time. You've been away. You've been with Animaniacs. You've been with what? You've been with the Deviled Kegs, but now... You're with CCS. You found your home. What's the future look like? What's this? What's season eleven going to look like for CCS three? Hmm. You know, I'm feeling ready to win again. Honestly, like we won Div A back then. Haven't won anything for like maybe two or three years in this game. I feel like it's time to get another win. So, whatever division we end up in NGS, we'll find out tomorrow in Mead Holland. I plan on winning it. It's good to hear, good to hear. Uh, how do you feel, like, as far as... Uh, I'm trying to think of a way to word this. So, as far as the, the hit that the Brock letter uh, inflicted... Um, and you know the whole fall of HCC and Heroes of the Dorm. Do you feel as though since the CCL has started, that that's kind of revitalized some of your passion for the game and 
uh, passion for improving and tryharding. Oh, absolutely. And I think it, that's the case for a lot of players. Like, CCL is an absolute godsend. Um, like, absolute huge thanks to everyone who's helped work on that, everyone who's helped donate to that prize pool, because CCL brings Killers of the Storm back into being an alive game, I think. And, yeah, I'm super excited to get back into the game and start tryharding and improving, because it feels like it did before. Um, and that's really exciting stuff. It is. It, it's a beautiful feeling. Um, and I'm so happy that you're excited about this and like this has brought this new passion um does tryharding you're a senior and you're a senior now in college right yeah does tryharding look different now than it did when you were a freshman like like, like the reality of of life as a you know then you know a frosh now at the end of your college career does tryharding look different or how does how do you balance the school and the and the game I have a lot less time now. Um, I definitely do not spend as much time practicing as I used to. I don't really usually describe myself as a super like mechanically gifted player per se. Like I started this game out absolute bottom of NGS, and I feel like I had to work really, really hard to get to the level that I did. So for me personally. I'm the kind of player who has to put a lot of work into the heroes I actually excel on. So, you know, part of the reason I'm playing at a lower division, part of the reason I'm not as good as I, I was in my prime, I believe, is just less practice time. But at the same time, you know, competitiveness, tryhardness is a mindset. So, you know, however many hours you practice, however, you know, however many free days you have to really train in this game and look to improve, um, that doesn't necessarily impact if you want to play super casually or super competitively. You know, you can practice absolutely zero in this game, but still go into every match with the mindset of, I really want to win. So for me, I'm a very competitive person. I think the rest of my team is feeling very, very competitive this season. So, you know, despite not having as much time to practice as I used to. I'm I'm still going for that W. Yeah, for sure. And and I definitely think that uh you know, as has been uh kind of portrayed here tonight that you you kind of stand as a a sort of beacon of inspiration for anyone else out there who may be, you know, at the bottom of Div C thinking like, man, it's it's impossible, it's too hard, they're just too good. Like if you put in the time and, and the effort, like you can climb up, right? Um, and, on, and on that note, uh, do you think if you were to be starting over from, like, if you if you could go back, like, what would you do different as far as your climb from the bottom? Hmm, that's that's a really excellent question. Um, I'd probably. give myself better concrete goals, I think. I think that's definitely a really smart thing that I underutilized was just giving myself personal goals to look forwards. A lot of my improvement was based around chasing people, right? Trying to catch up to people and surpass their level of improvement. And, you know, that works out really, really well sometimes, but other times people can kind of let you down like if you have a really really big rival in something and then all of a sudden they burn out and start either deteriorating or just straight up quitting you can feel a little bit lost and not be like oh where is where is this light that i'm chasing and i think the one thing that you can always depend on is just yourself compare your play to what it was, you know, a week ago. And give yourself these goals like, hey, I want to get really, really good at Zeratol. You know, um, right now my goal is to get really good at 
landing big VPs and just focus on that. Focus on that for like a week or a day or however long it takes you. And that's how you really cultivate this improvement without perhaps it being super dependent on someone else that you maybe can't control. That's an, I mean, that's an incredible tip. Um, how much time do you, um, Zhao, Zhao uh, told me that back in the, uh, in that first season that your team would scrim four hours a day and that you would then spend another two or three hours on top of that, just practicing solo lane la- matchups. Um, how much time do you spend outside of team practice these days as your time has gotten less? Just, just practicing, just drilling those VPs. Very little, honestly. Uh, you know, I, I do grind, get on the Storm League sadness train every <laughs> once in a while, but I haven't done a whole lot of like super, super personal, you know, I don't know, like, down and gritty, like just personal drilling things in. And I think it definitely shows. Like, I think I'm definitely rusty on a lot of things that were better when I were drilling these things. I definitely recommend it. But I just, unfortunately, have a really, really busy schedule these days and can't afford to do it as much as I'd like. But anybody who does have the time, like, I super, super encourage you to. Focus on these drills and focus on learning super, super specific things that you want to learn on Heroes. So when are you going to be a CCL masterclass teacher for us? When are you going to When are you going to teach all of us peasants how to hit those Zera tool combos? Are you gonna Are you gonna run a class at the CCS the next CCS Dev Day? Maybe. I'll have to see if the interest is there, you know, if people, if people are, you know, spamming in the Twitch chat, we want Michael in to, to do a Zeratul coaching session, then maybe I'll do it. I'm sure that we can get that. I would, I mean, a Zeratul coaching session would be amazing, but also like, I would love to hear the Michael and like, here's how to set goals for specific heroes and, or here is how to master combos. Um, Looks like Twitch chat has listened, though. Taijin dropping that. Well, we've been listening for this long. Um, <laughs> love it. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to do anything there's an interest in. Um, well, uh, Michael, and we've had you here for, an, uh, for quite a while, about an hour now, uh, and, and you've given us some incredible insight into it what looks to me and I think to all of us as an amazing career in Heroes of the Storm. And lucky for us, it's not over. Like there are more clips and more plays to be made in this upcoming season of season 11 uh, as you play with, with Kael'thas Can't Spell. Um, before we close out our show tonight, uh, Corinne, do you have any other questions for Michael? Uh, no, I think that's everything. Uh, and, and Michael, do you have any? Are there any questions that we didn't ask you? Things that you you wanted to be asked, or things that you would really just love to uh, have your time on the soapbox to be able to share? Hmm. I can't think of anything at the moment. I think I've said all I want to say, honestly. I, I can only talk about myself for so long before I feel a little bit too arrogant. Well, it's a confidence that is well-deserved. You've given some shout-outs to your team on CCS3 already. Uh, we'd love to give you the floor. If you want to make other shout-outs to, again, talk about how great CCS is or any other shout-outs, if you'd like, we'd love to give you the floor. Yeah, I mean, huge shout-outs to CCS. Absolute wonderful community. Huge shout-outs to my teammates. Um, even though I probably spend like every talking second just absolutely flaming them, I love them all, and I really love the improvement and growth we've shown, and I love playing with them so much. Huge shout-outs to my old teammates, especially Blasting Burrows, 
my dorm team, but also just anyone I've ever been on a team with. You guys have made me stay with this game this long, and you guys have have made this fun and awesome. And huge shout-outs to you guys for, for hosting this, having me on. It's been a true pleasure. And shout-outs to Twitch chat. Let's get some of that, that new Pog champ in here. Um, you know, Michael, you've been a great guest, and it's been, uh, it's been inspiring to me to do this research on you, but also to hear you, have you on the show, hear about your positivity, your outlook on the game. I know that I want to take the things we've talked about today and be take them back to my team and be a better competitor. Um, but that's going to wrap up this episode two. It's been fantastic. Um, appreciate you, Michael, and for being our guest. Our next week's guest is going to be... Uh, I don't have a drum roll, so sorry. There's no sound effects. We're too, uh, li- too low budge. Next week, episode three, our guest will be the main ski from CCS2. Um, one of the longest standing members of CCS that doesn't play for Can't Counterpick Stupid. So Mainski will be our next guest. We're excited to hear from him about his experience um, being on CCS2. So catch us next week at the same time, 11 p.m. Eastern, here on uh, twitch.tv slash hlsstoic. You can find me on Twitter at the same handle. Uh, you can find Critics on Discord. Michael and also on Discord. There's his tag. Um, in the meantime, before the next episode, if you have questions from for Mainski, please drop them in the uh, Discord under the podcast section, please. In the meantime, good luck, have fun in the Nexus, and we'll catch you guys and gals and non-binary pals next week. And shout out to Valk's mom. Oh, and sh- yes. Thanks, Thanks all. Valk's mom. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>